so many developments uh, happening elsewhere. <laughs> Professor Patricia O'Brien. Professor Monty, Ambassador Rana, Dr. Kelkar, and all friends. You know, on behalf of uh, India International Center and Institute of Chinese Studies, uh, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you. As you know, we have uh, gathered today to release our uh, new publication, <coughs> China at a Turning Point, Perspectives after the 19th Party Congress, and also hold a discussion on some important issues which are reflected in this volume. The release of uh, this publication is in fact a culmination of an important uh, project uh, which was initiated by the ICS uh, before the 19th Party Congress, 19th Congress of uh, the Communist Party of China in October 2017. We held uh, two intensive workshops, uh, one before the 19th Congress and one after the 19th Congress, when uh, papers which are included in the volume were first presented. And then uh, these papers were subjected to fairly long, almost year-long uh, scrutiny, discussion, dialogue, uh, which resulted in their finalization. And uh, today, uh, we have a book being released. As uh, Professor Monty has put uh, in his introduction to the volume, this publication contains uh, 25 papers presented by three generations of uh, Chinese scholars associated with the Institute of Chinese Studies uh, from Professor Kanchu to young Bhim Subha. And Bhim deserves a special recognition for all the hard work he did. The foreword has been written by Professor Patricia Obroy where she brings out um, you know, the journey of China studies over the last 50 years, where we stand today. And that forward is particularly you know, topical at this moment, because uh, later this year, we propose to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the establishment of China Study Group uh, in 1969, and its successor entity, the Institute of Chinese Studies. Uh, so thank you, Patricia, for your forward. But we owe a very big thank you to Professor Manoranjan Mohanty, who is really the spirit behind this project, more than this volume. He is the one who led the project and edited the volume. Uh, and I believe we have today with us uh, an important contribution to the existing literature on uh, China available in India. So thank you very much, Manu, for the labor of love that you put in in leading this project. <laughs> when we started uh, working on this project uh, sometime around the middle of 2017, we were quite clear in our mind that uh, we will not be looking only at what transpires at the 19th National Congress of the Communist Party of China. We wanted to go beyond that and uh, look at where China stands today in terms of multiple transitions the country is going through in its politics, its, its economy, society, ideology, external relations and more. As a result, uh, we have a fairly comprehensive study of major aspects of contemporary China by a group of committed scholars who are studying the country from a multidisciplinary approach. As I mentioned earlier, I do hope that uh, it will be an important addition to the literature available on China. You know, it's after considerable debate uh, internally that uh, we decide to call the volume China at a turning point. 
perspectives <laughs> after the 19th Party Congress. In fact, uh, Manu, I have several suggestions in this regard, and then uh, uh, we finally, you know, opted for it. Uh, in fact, the two workshops that we had, uh, there was a broad measure of consensus, though by no means unanimity, that China is at an inflection point, or perhaps more accurately, it has already negotiated that inflection point, but is in midst of transitions, its politics, its economy, its society, its diplomacy. Some scholars, in fact, uh, argue that China under Xi Jinping has entered a third phase, or even a third revolution, the first two being the establishment of the PRC under Mao and the launching of the policy reform and opening up under Tang. But the changes taking place are big enough to qualify as another revolution, or even a new phase in China's development in history is open to debate. But uh, there are undoubtedly major departures from Tang's legacy in Xi Jinping's China, a move away from collective leadership and the emergence of supreme leader in Xi Jinping's preference for a top-down, state-led <coughs> development model, in his explicit articulation and pursuit of China's great power, original global ambitions, and so on. While these policies crystallized at the 19th Party Congress, there are since then signs of recalibration. If there is a turning point, another half turn or quarter turn cannot be far behind in China. Thus, uh, with the intensification of the Sino-US trade technology and strategic rivalry, China great, China's great power ambitions are being downplayed. The message being conveyed to the USA and the rest of the world, both you know, publicly and privately, is that China doesn't wish to replace it replace the USA as a preeminent power, and that those fears are exaggerated. China is prepared to make some significant concessions to USA to buy time. There are indications that China might be prepared to repackage the Made in China 2025, improved market access for the USA, Western companies, and even India, and buy more from the USA. It has adjusted its policies vis-a-vis -vis key neighbors including India, Japan, and Korea. A question is also being debated whether she is inclined to veer away from the preference of the state-led, top-down model with the party playing an ever larger role, or give up industrial policy focused on innovation as driver growth, or downgrade China's ambitions. We have seen some signs over the past six months that Xi Jinping's top-down approach is becoming a little more flexible the construct of crossing the river, feeling stones, is back in his lexicon. He has spoken of giving local officials more latitude in implementing reforms. He has personally reassured the private sector and China's top banking regulators called on domestic banks to make sure that no less than 50% new corporate loans go to private business where that percentage at present is only around 25 percent, 25. These are signs which must be monitored closely to see whether there is a further half turn or quarter turn taking place, whether it's only the rhetoric which is changing or whether there's a real substantive shift occurring. My own feeling is that while Xi Jinping is making significant adjustments, he's basically staying the course. In terms of his own position as a supreme leader, expanding the role of the party, persisting with anti-corruption campaign, preference for the state-led development model, and pursuit of China's great power ambitions. Well, these are the issues uh, which have been discussed in the book, and I'm sure this discussion and dialogue will go on. Today, the way we have organized the function, you know, uh, after uh, overruling uh, some protests from uh, Manu, uh, Patricia has uh, instructed him to make the initial <laughs> remarks. <you know. laughs> so we'll introduce the book that he has so ably edited. Then after, Patricia will hand over the first copy of the book to 
Ambassador Kishadrana, I'll, I'll request you know, Patricia and Ambassador Rana to speak. Then we'll request you know, Dr. Govind Kelkar, a discussant, to talk about the book. But uh, before I invite you know, the panelists here to speak, uh, it gives me great pleasure to recognize amidst us uh, 15 contributors to this volume, this very important volume, not counting three who are present on this side of the room. And I'll just you know, read out the name because they have made very important contributions. And I'll suggest that when Q&A takes place, you know, apart from a panel responding, you can pose questions directly to these contributors as well. So we have with us, you know, uh, and one or two, I believe, are still on the way. Uh, Professor Shimati Chakravarti. Professor, <laughs> Professor Alka Acharya. Professor Sobri Mitra. Professor D.R. Deepak. Dr. T.G. Suresh. Suresh is, I think, uh, oh, he's there. Yes. Suresh, what are you doing there? <laughs> okay. Supposed to be in the front. Uh, Dr. Ravi Prashad Narayanan, has he reached? Uh, he is there. You're not supposed to be here. Uh, yes, no, he was supposed to be in the front. Uh, Dr. Jabin Jacob. Dr. Devashis Chaudhary. Dr. Usha Chandran. Dr. Rajiv Ranjan. Santosh Pai, Dr. Madhurma Nandi, Dr. T.K. Anand, Dr. Deen Supa, and Mr. Kirishma. Thank you very much. Welcome all of you. Uh, may I now invite uh, Professor Man Manajin Mohanty to speak. Friends, uh, I think this has been a a real delight to do this project, uh, also a challenge. Uh, the delight is because we really took stock of three generations of scholarship and had people who have worked at least 10 years, no, at least 15 years in a certain field and as much as 50 years in their fields, they are the contributors. And therefore, uh, really having three generations of scholarship uh, in uh, a project uh, was quite, quite uh, a delight. Uh, and, uh, you know, we always value the foreign scholars more than Indian scholars. We don't quote ourselves, we don't quote each other. Our newspapers first invite some foreign uh, scholars. Uh, if they are uh, Indian origin, fine, otherwise <laughs> And uh, uh, I really felt, I mean, some of us have been more lucky than others, uh, no doubt. But uh, I really found in this, exercise that uh, we have graduated our body of scholarship uh, on China has graduated to a level uh, where uh, Indian scholarship is no less than scholarship anywhere. <coughs> and uh, this is not just to boast, this is because uh, the three generations, particularly the last generation uh, has spent two to three years at least in China doing field work. They know the language. Uh, they and the unique interdisciplinarity that we insist on. Everyone knows Chinese history, geography, culture, uh, and brings uh, those dimensions to whatever you are studying, whether it is media or women or law, whatever you may be studying. You bring in history, culture, and your, your totality. But what is more important is, and this is where between Thantung and I, and Patricia overseeing the whole thing, 
uh, you know, we have, we have something to do with theory and paradigms and frameworks and discourse analysis. So we, you know, sometimes just throw, uh, would you, would you uh, think about use of this concept or this term or uh, you, th you think um, there are other ways. In other words, bringing theoretical dimensions to whatever you are studying, whether it is gender or, I mean, uh, the IR, the three IR, two IR papers and one on military, you'll see how theory has come there. The media, the environment, the, you know, all those uh, papers. Uh, so bringing history, theory, culture, interdisciplinarity into our scholarship, our treatment of specific issues. I think that has been uh, really uh, a delight in this. Uh, but there are challenges. Uh, the challenges were that, uh, you know, it was a time bomb project. We didn't want to delay it and several of us were feeling impressed. Why the delay? And everyone came forward and I'm, I'm absolutely grateful to the, the editorial committee that we have mentioned here. I mean, there are many others who have contributed uh, to this process, but uh, Alka Acharya, Ravi Bhutalingam, unfortunately Ravi is abroad, so he's not able to join this. Uh, Asok Kantha, Kishan Rana, Bhim Subba, and Patricia. Uh, you can see from Kishan to Bhim uh, how uh, we have uh, the um, absolute commitment and uh, some uh, desperate moments they have tried to solve. And uh, Savari Mitra, uh, whom we don't put as an editorial committee member, but was the language and culture expert on everything. So all the papers, <coughs> any doubt about any term, uh, any translation, any uh, you know opinion, expression, she was there. So we have uh, we have this group which uh, came. So um, so the first challenge was that we could not cover several aspects. Uh, so the economy. We have two very, very important papers. Uh, Anand's paper, Devin's paper are very important. Um, uh, and Arvind <coughs> Yale, three papers actually. Uh, but there are you know, the usual industry, agriculture, services, foreign trade, you won't find those four directly dealt with. They're covered indirectly in some of these essays. So that was one challenge. And we thought that we should still go ahead because on those issues, uh, you know, there are many other studies and uh, not just China scholars, you know, economists and others, they have, they have written, some of them are present here, actually. <coughs> uh, that was one challenge. The other challenge was uh, about perspectives. You know, we have the subtitle as perspectives, not one perspective. <coughs> now, uh, is there and Indian perspective. Sometimes we are invited by, you know, foreign press uh, or foreign editors <laughs> of volumes and so on to contribute an Indian perspective. Uh, I think many of us, our first reaction is, look, it is my perspective. Um, I mean, you know, the people who are sitting here, all of us have different perspectives. ICS has always had, all the 50 years, multiple perspectives. And uh, therefore, uh, and that is our strength. Uh, therefore, there is indeed plurality of views. You can say the flip side is that, uh, you know, therefore there are contradictory formulations. Yes, the reader should get contradictory formulations. And then, you know, see them, how to, uh, I mean, uh, which one can, uh, can be more persuasive. In fact, I mentioned this in my introduction also. So multiple perspectives. It's not just one perspective that you'll find. <coughs> the third challenge was the uh, fast developing situation in China. And uh, a book on, uh, on the aftermath of the 19th Party Congress. It should be, should it be dated? Should it be quickly produced as a, you know, uh, a contemporary commentary? We decided no. We will take our time. Not too long, but we will take our time. This will be 
read even 20 years from now because each one of us, we have a large section on the party, party and uh, organization parties, <coughs> membership parties, uh, anti-corruption campaign parties, uh, you know, the institutions, party congress history, you know, where those reflect 10 years of studies, those reflect a lifetime of scholarship uh, of those people who have written uh, on, on those issues, on, uh, on party or ideology or history and uh, law and so on. Uh, therefore, uh, it is not a quick commentary on an event. Uh, uh, and, but the challenge was always there, that there are, uh, you know, the 13th NPC came and we covered that. Now, <coughs> next week begins the 14th NPC. I mean, 13th NPC, next session, uh, the second session of the 13th NPC. Therefore, uh, there will be new documents, but I can uh, suggest that the formulations and analysis and the perspectives presented by the authors here will be still the reference points for any subsequent analysis on those aspects. Uh, but the challenge of the time was very much there. <coughs> now, I don't want to go on, uh, and because uh, uh, the director has already more or less summarized the main issues, uh, the three very important dimensions that we capture in this. Uh, one is the transition, uh, as he put it. And we have taken the term new era very seriously. That, that uh, they announced and they, they are talking, uh, that is the uniform concept uh, in all fields. What is this new era and its characteristics? Uh, and the new era with a very clear objective. The uh, objective is uh, uh, strong China by, by 20. 2049 would be the centenary of the PSC. Uh, and therefore, uh, and I don't want to uh, dwell on that, we have written a lot uh, on that. Uh, Mao Zedong had said China had stood up on the 1st of October 1949. So the anti-imperialist uh, struggle had achieved some victory and China had now some dignity in the world. Then, Junko Fuji Laina, China had become rich because of conserving reform policies. Now everybody talks about Chiang Chi Lai, how to, China, how to make China strong by 2050. And uh, I don't know whether uh, everybody knows, there is a joke in China, Sui Xi Chiang that is, Sui um, uh, Xi means study, uh, Chiang Kai is strong China, strong country, okay? But Sui, Xi, Xi for Xi Jinping, okay? So you study Xi Jinping thought, <coughs> only then you can contribute to the building of a strong China. So this is the flavor of the time that we are talking about. So that is one, the transition to making China strong. The second is, and we have a large number of contributions, and I think that is the strength of this book. Well, all, all sections have uh, very important contributions, but you know the socio-economic uh, se section is excellent. I really enjoy it. I, I really felt that from foreign policy-centric, security-centric China studies, we have moved to history, culture, uh, and very, 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 very specific dimensions, <coughs> labor, and social welfare, women, media, environment, uh, regionalism, uh, and, and uh, excellent uh, contributions like that. <coughs> Therefore, um, but there is a there is a running thread in those that the Tang framework, which had evolved in a certain direction, how that had changed in each of these sectors. And that is what uh, this new era uh, dimension uh, focuses. Uh, finally, of course, the party section and there are many papers which talk about the political system, the polity, and we have very interesting contributions. 
and that is related to the foreign policy. We have two major papers on foreign policy. There's so much flow and are connected with the way China is relating internally and externally. Uh, that is what we talk about. So uh, I think I have spoken enough. Just to conclude, I will say that uh, the uh, <coughs> complexity of understanding China is what comes out. But this complexity should not be an alibi for not clarity, not expressing certain clear understanding. For example, clarity about authoritarianism, centralized character, some of the issues that the director talked about. Uh, and the Xi Jinping manner of dissent management. I think we have very interesting papers. You know, several of them I see here. Uh, our ethnicity section and the corruption sex section, the law, they talk about this. So that is, uh, that is something that come, 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 comes out. But, and this is uh, being personal here, uh, my conclusion from this study gets uh, actually uh, confirmed uh, from my uh, studies, my own studies and own writings, including the China's Transformation book, namely that there are large areas of success, mostly economic, technological, innovation, uh, military, uh, big power successes, and but there are serious problems social, economic, uh, environmental <coughs> problems. Uh, therefore, an understanding of this complexity of success and problems is what we all try to convey uh, as the common thread in this book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Basmati, for that very lucid introduction to the volume. Uh, may I now request uh, Patricia, Professor Patricia O'Brien to present a copy of the book to Ambassador Kishan Well, uh, this is the ceremonial part. <laughs> and then we'll have the release of the book. Now, of all the contributors to this volume, uh, the senior most is Professor Han Chung, who has related this very uh, specific analysis of very contemporary events uh, to the long course of Chinese history and civilization. It's a fascinating paper, whether you agree with it or not. But the second senior most is our friend Ambassador Kishin Rana. Um, he and I uh, were together in Hong Kong in the year 1963, and he has specifically forbidden me to say that at the language school at the University of Hong Kong, he was teacher's pet. I won't say that he was teacher's pet, but I would say that he was the most debonair and talented of the students there, and has become a lifelong friend and a very serious critic. A lot of the, I think, the fact that this book happened is partly due to the fact that he wields a whip whenever it's, it's needed. And we all have to jump when he wields a whip. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be feeling rather sore. So, um, I, as the senior most... <laughs> as the senior most among us, and one of our um, most valued contributors, I might say, because independently fulfilling Professor Mahanti's uh, uh, agenda, he has managed to combine the, the uh, interest in the theoretical aspects of diplomacy with the nitty <coughs> gritty of China's own diplomacy. So, and Asian diplomacy, for heaven's sake. So with that introduction, to uh, the person who wasn't the teacher's pet. Uh, may I say, uh, please uh, accept this tribute uh, from, uh, from one of us. Thank you.
followed by the National People's Congresses are the basic stuff that lots of China watchers worldwide uh, uh, look at. The build-up, the proceedings, actually, when you watched, rather boring. Did you see people found sound asleep during the proceedings? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> they were. And then the cameras shifted quickly away. And then the aftermath, particularly the National People's Congress, and now we are moving on from that. Um, but um, obviously, ICS from the beginning has taken a great interest in such events, in analysis of the documents and the proceedings. And if I'm not mistaken, though I may be, I think Professor uh, Ambassador Ranganathan, uh, uh, in uh, collaboration with ICWA, edited a volume on the 18th the previous uh, party congress. But our efforts have, during all these years, uh, been marked by what has already been referred to as a belief in the importance of probing the relationship between China's domestic policy and international relations. And I think this is something that Alka has addressed particularly in her paper. And China's own understanding and self-positioning in the world. And when we're talking about a turning point, we are seeing this, the latter, the self-positioning in the world as one of the very important turning points. Uh, secondly, there was always a widely uh, shared commitment to doing something which has become rather unpopular in the world, namely taking so-called ideology seriously, and not just as a veil for real politics, but as something that you need to pay attention to, whether ultimately you come to the conclusion that it is indeed a veil. Uh, this volume, as Professor Mahanti said, considers m many more questions than are normally contained uh, in the separate discursive silos of China watchers. It looks at the um, imbalances provoked by the reforms project, the regional, ethnic, and I'm pleased to say, except the author has disappeared, the gender uh, aspects of even such, such a, a, an event. It looks at the environmental uh, consequences of the reforms. It looks at the strengthening of the rule of law and the limitations therein. And it looks amazingly at questions of culture, which and the whole idea of national rejuvenation, whatever that might be, <coughs> and the building of socialism with Chinese characteristics, if this is not a contradiction in terms. The realizing of the Chinese dream, and I think this is something that Tan Chung's paper talks to, and not only materially, and not only, but, but also in terms of China's power in the global, on the global stage, and with reference to some unspecified Chinese essence and civilization. 
Now, I had earlier uh, decided that I was not the person to write for this particular volume, and lo and behold, I was asked to write a foreword. And when that happened, I felt truly that everything had been said. Actually, there are important gaps, but with 25 papers already, you would say that there's quite a lot been, been said. Um, so, in, uh, and um, I felt that, you know, any more that I might say would be absolutely redundant as it is at this present moment. But instead of um, summing up, I thought I would just emphasize some of the points that Professor Mahanti makes in his introduction. First of all, he does emphasize that there are three generations of Ch uh, China scholars here. In fact, I'd almost say four. I wonder how one counts these generations. From uh, C.V. Ranganathan and Kishan Rana, uh, through the next generation, another generation, and finally to the heroic being who <laughs> suffered, <laughs> suffered throughout this whole process. Then there is, of course, the range <coughs> of subjects taken up. The increasing competence of our scholars with, and familiarity with Chinese language, the increased fam familiarity with scholars with Chinese society, the many more opportunities the younger generation have had after the, the many years when there's no academic or other uh, civil society contact whatsoever. And this all made me review, uh, sort of look back rather sentimentally on the ICS beginnings uh, 50 years ago on the lawns of Sapu House. Uh, I, um, and as remarked, in a way we are picking off uh, this collective volume, a commemoration of that begin beginning and a note of hope for the future professionalization of China's studies in India. Uh, so going back to the Sapu House lawn, the nasty canteen down the back, the interesting people sort of sitting around, the library, a wonderful space, the journalists from all over, the whole hub of Mundi House where that was located. And the China Studies group in those days were, after all in 1969, were people who saw themselves as coming from all different directions. There were terrible arguments in this little group, even though there were only uh, five, eight, ten at the most of us. Terrible arguments on ideological and other matters. We were basically, as they say, whistling in the dark. And um, on, uh, so all that takes us back. And also to other, this was a civil society initiative. And so was the founding of the Indian School of International Studies as a introducing international relations as a professional activity for, for independent India. Before independence, I guess, there was no international relations as an academic discipline <coughs> in the same way. And that marked the invention of international relations. <coughs> And the other thing that happened at the governmental level post-1966 was the UGC Area Studies Program. So, um, as I said, for a whole generation, um, access to China was closed, but now one is happy, as Professor Mahanti said, to witness a quantitative and qualitative growth and in the wide-ranging aspects of China's studies. This is extremely well, welcome, uh, not only in the utilitarian sense, that is no more about another country, but epistemologically as well. But as he also said, there are challenges and there's a long way to go that we have to think about collectively. Uh, Indian-China studies, I don't think, is recognized <coughs> on the global stage except insofar as Indians are commenting on uh, and writing about India-China relations. That is, if you look at, probably you look at citations, probably very few of us have cited ever by anybody. Maybe Professor Mahandi might be a, 
different, different uh, Kishin Rana is a, an expert in diplomacy, but on the whole, leaving aside India-China relations, we're not cited for contributing to knowledge, what so very much at all. And uh, the other um, thing that I wanted to go bring up was that many of the debates in olden days used to be about, is there an Indian perspective on China? And they didn't mean only an Indian, people were not meaning only an Indian perspective in a geopolitical sense, that is, we are Indians and they are Chinese, so let a, you know, we have a different perspective. We have a, a national perspective. But is there something cognitive or uh, epistemological that people socialized in this environment can bring to the table? Now, in my own discipline, anthropology or social anthropology, this has also been a great deal of debate. Does it matter that you've been brought up in a different cultural framework? Or are we just getting better and better, hopefully, at conforming to global, global standards? <coughs> this morning I thought, let me prepare for this by going back to the work of one of the early uh, China studies people, the famous, uh, or rather, Sino-Tibetan Sanskrit studies people, Professor P. C. Bagchi, and look at uh, look at his book and think there was someone who was thinking as an Indian, but trying to write differently about China. I read that. You know, one, one of his uh, most famous book sort of skims through it with admiration and uh, I mean his scope is absolutely breathtaking but I thought this is not the time to go back <coughs> over that trail of the Buddhist influence and so on but to <coughs> recapture the spirit where we might be able to think independently and not only take our knowledge via the circuits of Euro-American scholarship. I hope that someday that may and will happen, not only in this, this field of knowledge, but in other fields as well. I'm not that confident it will, but I think there are possibilities, and our predecessors and ancestors have shown what some of them might look like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for those remarks, including that sobering thought uh, which has told us that uh, Indian studies on China are yet to really earn full recognition globally. Uh, may I now request uh, the last question, Thank you very much, Ashok. Uh, one worthy Patricia from the Telkar friends. I have really very little to say. What uh, I have a, an essay in the book. Uh, it speaks for itself. Uh, it's, a, it's a fine work, but badly delayed. Professor uh, Murthy, I say, because uh, I expected to have it out by March 2018, and we are almost one year behind our schedule. You can now make a virtue out of it, but I'm afraid the reality is that we were just too bloody slow. Uh, second, uh, I'm delighted that Patricia referred to uh, the uneven quality, shall we say, of uh, China scholarship in India. Lack of uh, uneven scholar, uneven quality of China scholarship, and um, uh, scarcity of citation. That's a challenge for the young generation, I would submit. But it's also a matter of organization. I mean, we must, we are probably the only major country in the world where a person can engage in area studies without bothering to study the language. You can be a scholar of Arab affairs without learning Arabic. You can be a scholar of Japanese affairs without speaking Japanese because 
these exist in different silos and these silos don't talk to each other. The language silo and the area studies silo. Uh, and it seems that nobody can, can put this together. Of course there are people who uh, surmount this and people who uh, are both uh, recognized area specialists and speak the relevant languages. But it is not a requirement in India, and uh, even for doing a PhD, uh, nowhere in the world, as far as I know, can this be uh, can this be done. Uh, and then there is the scarcity of scholars, the relatively small number that seem interested, seem committed to take on a major uh, challenge. Uh, like China studies, from the perspective of different disciplines. I mean, you don't have to be only a scholar of China. You may be an environmentalist or an economist and have a China perspective, have a sense of connection with China's role in that particular discipline or that particular activity. Uh, the Institute of Chinese Studies has tried to foster this, to encourage this, but I don't think we've had any remarkable success in this so far. It comes to the point where major scholarships offered uh, through this institute and elsewhere uh, almost go a begging. Uh, there is a Harvard Yenching Fellowship for which, uh, when I used to be on the selection committee before I was gently thrown out, um, <coughs> Uh, there was there were really very very few applicants, and uh, I think uh, was it last year that, as against two scholarships that were available, we ended up eventually sending only one person. Now, this is bizarre because these are fully funded scholarships. They connect with major institutions in China and in the U.S., but there is a scarcity of takers. So somewhere we are not perhaps yet, we have not yet woken up to the notion that this large country that lies to our east and north is a country that is worth studying. It's a country of which we have to know more. We have to understand that country better. Um, this is my lament uh, that we don't do this enough. But I know that our final speaker today has a formidable collection of notes, and she will have infinitely more to say than the one or two thoughts I've thrown on the table. So I will stop here and uh, congratulate Manu and the Institute on finally putting out this book. <laughs> and um, I hope it uh, is widely read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, especially for reminding us of challenges that we need to deal with. Though on Kavadi and Ching fellowship, sir, uh, I think we are getting good response and we are selecting some good candidates. Last year we had two very good scholars who have been selected. This year again we had a good response, we have selected two good scholars. Uh, finally, you know, I'll request uh, Dr. Govind Kelkar. She will discuss and she can speak, speak from here or there as you like. About myself, I am a proud student of Professor Khancho. Srimati has often introduced me as the first PhD from Chinese department, so I am very proud to be here with you. Uh, distinguished panelist, I would speak informally and I would speak a uh, uh, little bit outside the book uh, because so much has been said about the book and I, I am very, very impressed by the book. Uh, I have become wiser by the authors, so it's a highly timely book. But what, why I would be speaking differently is uh, about, not in terms of the theme, but in terms of, uh, I have been for the past 15 days in two meetings, 
and very intense meetings. One was on really on it is called geopolitics of um, uh, Asian countries, but particularly it is focused on China because five scholars and activists we got from China and their, for their visa we said, and meeting was held in uh, Malaysia and Penang. So that was the meeting on PRI, Belt Road Initiative. So that is one thing. I Most of my life I work on the subject of gender equality and land rights, women's land rights, I started from China. And I've been very impressed with the Maoist programs. So till date I remain a Maoist. So with all the kind of critique, so that is the, these are the two, three things I would talk about. One I would talk about really, and I have read the book, so please don't think I have not read the book. <laughs> so that is the, that is the, oh. So uh, two, three things I would talk about is really about BRI, Belt Road Initiative, how the others think about China in <coughs> Southeast Asia, outside India, I am talking about. Uh, and then uh, in Southeast Asia, in the Pacific Islands, and in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, how our neighbors, how do they think about China's uh, new policy? And uh, what happened after the 19th Party Congress in October 2017? Three, three major achievements and advancements that have been talked about. One is the higher, land, higher levels of living standards. Second would be higher levels of infrastructure. And third was the new global standing. And Professor Monty, in your introduction, you also talk about this. Interestingly, when the Chinese scholars came, and they were from civil society members, the G Hub, Greeno, uh, what is that? Greeno Innovation, and uh, also some uh, academics from Beijing University, and also those people who have set up hotline for violence against women. So these are the kind of people, activists and scholars I'm talking about, whose perspective. I thought I'll share it with you because this is an important occasion. So this new era that China, new era is the all-powerful authority of Xi Jinping, is really marked by the, very well pointed out, by the dissent management. Huh? including earlier from the time when Bo Xilai was arrested. So this is how the civil society sees this kind of and anti-corruption, they think that there is a lot of corruption, but anti-corruption movement is really in terms of used for, to manage the dissent. That was their interpretation. So that is an important thing. Their governance is marked by reduced growth, and as the new normal. I like the word new normal very much because this is going to be the new normal. Some economists say it is the heated economy China has gone through and now it is going to be on the decline. So why not rationalize it and why not before it really goes down, why not? And this is a very important factor in terms of managing it. Second would be by 2020 what they end absolute poverty and that is achievable uh, the way that things have progressed in China. But what about inequality? That is what has been the major concern. And inequality is causing really some dissent in many corners, and particularly the uh, neighbors are very restive uh, in, uh, with regard to when we discuss China with admiration, because Mongolia was very highly, highly <coughs> critical kind of thing. That is, uh, uh, with the, there were two, three uh, persons came from Mongolia. In view of this, I will uh, kind of touch upon in these, uh, that's why I thought of, okay, let me talk about uh, this thing. Although China is still claims for two things, that uh, it is really building BRI for the, along with the cultural, there are soft power. Uh, this is seen as building a soft power. Not through militarily, but going on in terms of the cultural aspect, there have been uh, uh, there have been a seminar and ICS also which were very good, but there were others also who presented in these two meetings. So, so China, if we want to assess today China, I would really use the framework of three aspects in which we as members of uh, academy, as the members of civil society are engaged. One is the question of equality. Not only poverty, now this is the age of the sustainable development goals. 
and we are very much part of it, India, China, they have all committed to it, the state has committed to it. So the three major issues are <coughs> equality, social equality and gender equality in particular, inequality in particular. Second is sustainability. The question of environment, uh, as you pointed out very well, the question of environment in the infrastructure development through BRI projects, not only through BRI projects, but also through other two institutions from which China obviously doesn't take any loan for this kind of project, BRI project, but at the same time, they have the means of exerting its influence and building the soft power. This is the new development bank, which was earlier called the BRICS Bank, and AI, AIIB, uh, Asian Infrastructure, uh, Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank. So these are the two means on which there is a kind of collaboration with the government. So you make a deal with the government, you make a deal with the major kind of party, and then you expand your trade relations, then you expand your finance rela financial relations, but at the same time, what is there behind it? Because somebody, uh, there is a BRICS feminist watch that has been set up in India, and they are doing an assessment, I am also a member of that, we are do the, doing the assessment of Madhya Pradesh project, where the NDB has given the uh, loan to them. And what I've seen that, what is the, how the total kind of people's <coughs> wishes and the participation, everything is ignored. But it is in collaboration with the Madhya Pradesh government and with the government of India. So the China is not only the culprit. One of the person in this meeting said, if you want to really improve China, one of the Chinese participants said, why don't you build movement in your country also? Why you are putting blame on us that we should do something to correct our government? You also build a movement rather than debating it. And this is a very important kind of thing, but it was a feeling of hopelessness also that was being expressed. This, these were the people of the Green G Hub uh, uh, organization. So that third, frame, third component of the framework is renewable energy. China has done very well in solar energy, other forms of renewable energy, and its development in different kind of um, uh, different countries through BRI project. Within the country it is quite sound, but outside in Pakistan and other countries you <coughs> find them that uh, there is a coal powered system they are building it, coal fired uh, system they are building up. Within the country it is okay. So this duality of the relations that one has to see us and them, uh, the others, the others. African countries were also very powerful in saying that uh, that how we are treated as the others. So this is the trade and finance system, and I'm not an economist. Trade and political economy I do, but trade and finance system are very, very important to look at China today, and I have grown up. I grew up admiring China, and I still, uh, I said that kind of thing. So my critique really comes from, as a sometimes feeling kind of let down. In the context of China, Infrastructure Development Plan is very essential if you want to look at the polity, the society of China, how and the authority of the and plan of the Xi Jinping. In the context of China, then uh, food security, lot of civil society is working for the food security. China is also very concerned about the food security. That's what the Chinese participants said, and I was surprised. And they are going for the industrial and commercial production of the food within 40, what is that, JD, JD.com's company, which will provide uh, any food to Chinese uh, consumers from anywhere in the world in 48 hours. And many companies like this are developing. On the one hand, this is a very powerful, you provide very organic food and other things to Chinese consumers, but there is a commercial and industrial production. And farmers, what is happening to farmers is that we need to understand. So that would be important. So there is a serious concern about BRI, uh, uh, worsening the lot of discussion on the expropriation of the land, which is we, we simply call it land grabs. In these land grabs, what is happening to women? How there is a non-compliance of regulation? The government gives the regulation, but there is a non-compliance of these regulations. There is indebtedness, what happened in Sri Lanka, if vote has been taken, I mean BRI, you see that. 
environmental concern and health impacts. They are not given any kind of due attention. The women question in China, I will take, do I have another five minutes? Or not? Two minutes. Okay. And the uh, women question in China, I learned from them, and that's how we came the kind of, uh, you know, got into feminist analysis by women hold up half the sky. Okay, it is still there. Uh, later it was cultural evolution, whether what men can do and Usha has pointed out, women can also do, that was done. There was also, and we are talking in this age, unpaid care, but during the lengthy house period, the care work was very much, household work was very much kind of uh, promoted as a campaign that men should do the housework. Now we are talking of the sustainable development goal, but these things have been forgotten in building the new China, which were the critical aspect of how China is different. Why do we admire China? That was the kind of, uh, uh, that was the period. Retirement age, I don't want to repeat, Usha has very well summed up uh, the, uh, in terms of the, what are the number of the women in a standing committee, in Politburo, where and where, and you see that how much marginality is about the 50% of the population. And actually India and China are not 50% population, they are only 48% women are in the population. And this is not that they are not born, it is the question of missing women, which Amartya Sen has very much pointed out. So the question is, when, if we really want to study China in my view, we should be looking at its achievement and the means of achievement and how it is uh, achieving it. So in uh, the what has been really the major concern among the policy makers in China the, or uh, the people who want to do it? They say absence of a clear definition of public interest. So there are regulations, but it is not being defined. Ambiguous rules on the distribution of already limited compensation of the affected farmers. This is the land grab that is going on in the process of urbanization. And China has done so well in urbanization. Unfair statutory compensation standards, universal lack of consideration for affected women's interest in land expropriation, land grab. And these are written by Chinese scholars, Len Ping, who is a member of the Landesa, where I work, I mean Landesa office in Seattle and in Beijing. And these are, there are inadequate procedural safeguards that are not there. So whatever the safeguards are there, they are not implemented. And what safeguards are there, they seem very good, but they are not implemented. Then you see that kind of the property law for women is not implemented by the village committee. Property law, which was formed in first uh, rural land contracting law in 2010 and 2007. <coughs> women don't get the land rights either in the marital home or in the uh, parental home. This is the, this has been the problem and we, in China, the revolution is started. Uh, uh, China, the revolution for women is started on two fronts in 1949. One was the land question. So land was given to women, and how many women were killed in protest also, quietly killed in the within the home. And second was the self-arranged marriages. And these two things are on the decline. The government is trying to correct these policies, but these policies in the social norms and Han patriarchy, they are not really happening. Now, I would be very happy in terms of looking at, these studies have been done, uh, of the looking at the 44 villages in China, that it was found that only about 7% women got the right to land. It comes as a surprise to me also, because all my life I have worked on the land rights to women in China is doing so well. And actually it has liberated a kind of thing. Uh, so, co coming back to uh, civil society, we were told by the Chinese scholar there are two kinds of civil society organizations in China. And I think we should be studying civil society in China. One is the charity-oriented organization, church, um, religious, and all this. Second is the private foundations. They are doing well. And third is the rights-based organization. Which are the rights-based organization? Rights-based organization are UN bodies, bilaterals like CEDA, who can talk of rights-based approaches, but they still be in China. So that they are called the rights-based approaches. So I think we know well enough that uh, if you don't criticize the current, present government, then you are well. So these, uh, <coughs> these rights-based approaches are also tolerated 
but they also play safe. That would be the uh, kind of uh, one thing uh, uh, would be. There. And my last point would be that how to promote China to help to achieve its ambitions in G20 meetings or other meetings. They are promoted very well, those organizations. That will be one. So we seem to be really talking of the shrinking space, like we many organizations, civil society organizations face in India. And Xi Jinping, of course, is also managing that very well. And uh, without much kind of hue and cry as it is happening about India. Uh, there were case studies from Pakistan. Pakistan was a very bad case in terms of what is happening under BRI project. Africa was a bad case, not even employment was given. Uh, so these new economic corridors that are being built in, uh, in, uh, under BRI, they are creating a, not admiration, but they are creating really the China trying its best to build the soft power, that is the, and wants to be powerful. Maybe openly they are saying we don't want to be America because America is really kind of hard power, military power, strike here and there. China, China will probably not do that. But in terms of economic control, financial control, that is definitely is going to be their global strategy. Going global strategy, again is repeated, going global, which was done in 2001, I think. It was the first time they said two in 2001. But now it is renewed. There are posters about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelton, for discussing those issues, important issues that have all been raised in the book. Well, now we have a very limited time, maybe about 15, 20 minutes available for Q&A. Uh, so what we'll do, we'll club you know, three, four questions. Our responses can either be given by the panel or the contributors of the <coughs> Okay, let's start with you. Can someone bring the mic? I'd like to know in the context of the current conflict, going on between India and Pakistan, uh, has China increasingly become a more responsible power? Has Trump, in fact, forced the Chinese to be more responsible uh, by, uh, is he hurting or helping the process? And, uh, see, in the case of Kargil and Bangladesh also, they did not directly interfere, but in this case, they seem to be adopting a more positive approach. Would you agree? The second question is, when you say that uh, we are not studying China, and Indian scholarship is not putting enough emphasis, what about the other way around, are the Chinese studying India? Thank you. Much more. Professor Obra said that uh, Indian scholarship is not being cited anywhere. What do you think is the reason for it? Is it not good enough, according to, you, to all the people themselves? Or is it not being marketed well? Or do we feel that there's enough expert scholarship available all over, <laughs> so we don't have to come up to that path? Thank you. As you said that China is uh, building up its soft power by way of developing OBUR or BRI project. Uh, so it is developing uh, CPEC, uh, China Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, as part of the same BRI OBUR One Belt One Road project. So uh, China is repeatedly in the present context, as the first questioner asked. Like in the present, because China is repeatedly vetoing the India's attempt to get the talents that is listed by UNFC. Uh, so, can China adopt a more uh, friendlier, positive policy on terrorism uh, in the changed uh, international economic order and its, in context of its 
continued statement with U.S. as economic standoff with U.S. Thank you. There was a question about the quality of scholarship in India about China and in China about India. China has many, many more people working on it. Many new institutes have been set up across the country and they network among themselves and they do a pretty good job. I would say uh, it's at least three to four times more intensive than in the case of India. Why are we not cited? I don't know. Uh, is it, uh, you think there is a sinister plot somewhere? <laughs> no, you didn't say that, but somebody may say that, oh, you know, these foreigners, they are always trying to do us down. But that's not the case. And, and for, uh, as for your question, sir, about uh, uh, you talked about uh, China uh, the veto. Uh, the, the China is becoming more responsive. Current current situation. It's a question of how you interpret things. The Suggestion seems to be, from what I've read, is that China is not jumping up and down in support of China, in, a very, in support of Pakistan, in a very big, in a very intense way. China is cautious, and China is concerned, I suppose, like any other country, about its image and how it looks. But you know, we don't take into account the impact of uh, terrorism on China itself. What is happening in Xinjiang today, it's up to a billion people undergoing, Uyghurs undergoing re-education. This is surely an issue to which the world should be worth more attention than it does. Thank you. Uh, citation in uh, issue, um, I think it's a, a bit of all these factors. Uh, but basic, basically, I didn't say it, it, altogether, it, it, it was altogether a lack of citation. Indians speaking about India-China relations, everyone is interested. But speaking about anything else to do with China that might have a professional base, whether it's culture, language, literature, uh, polit politics, society, um, there are other centers in the world which have, a, have a, a seats of knowledge and expertise. Uh, I might say that um, even in my own discipline, anthropology and sociology, um, you often feel you might as well not have existed, except in so far as you have a propriety interest in things that are, you're an informant on India, not a thinker, writer, or professional. That's it. When you're an informant, that's okay. Otherwise, who is interested? Please. Sir, my question is to Madhavan and Monty, sir. Monty, sir, a couple of years ago, you said in uh, ICOs that every day China receives one million, com uh, every day China receives a million complaints of corruption. Now the corruption has spread to all over the all over the world. Uh, even a couple of days ago, Pakistan complained about a 400 kilometer highway. So there was a statement from Chinese SOE that we are not uh, doing indulged in corruption. So now the map also had said there are issues in Africa and <coughs> other places. So where do you see this? Means a couple of years ago it was internal, now it has become global. We have two contributors who have written on corruption. So I will request uh, Ravi Narayan, Ravi Prasad Narayan, and this to respond to that question. Just a question. I haven't seen the book yet. Uh, do you deal with the with the huge improvement in academic work in China over the last twenty years? And how and why it happened. Uh, 
as compared to ours, number one. But I would like me to comment on this question, issue of not being quoted, and the next moment of IT. Uh, it's true for all regimes. And it's because we accepted our position as informants in the 19th century. And it's continual. Because we're not supposed to generate knowledge. We're supposed to consume knowledge. So if you provide theory, you're not liked. If you provide information about India, you're liked. Global conspiracy. <laughs> it's not a conspiracy. That's how it is. Because you can ask anyone in any field, including the sciences. We can provide data except very few stalwarts whose theories are accepted. The next level they are not. We are not supposed to speak on theory. And I can say this about my own field. Which is? Which is traffic management and safety. We are not supposed to know. I have just been at an international meeting where the Swedes said we will tell you what to do in India. You give us the... <coughs> Historians may be an exception. No, Historians are not Indian. Not about war. The best scientist, historian. But who is the person who has written recently history? Connected history. He is very well quoted. He is Indian Superman. Connected history. So I agree. I will just end up making an observation on the on the kind of tangential point, but it is very central to what Professor Oberoi said, and I very much respect the perspectives that have been shared here on why. Why, you know, if you're not cited, I think. Let's not be so despairing. I think there are disciplines where we have earned the equity, I think, with, with its economics, its political science, its uh, history, and it's uh, even a history for its something that I don't particularly subscribe to, but subaltern history was, I think, India's contribution to historiography. So I guess there are <coughs> a point to be taken by, in what Professor Oberoi said, that We've come a long way in these 50 years in our study of China, but yet, apart from perhaps India-China relations, in terms of the kind of international brand equities that there were, names like Fairbanks and MacArthur, and you know, the big names that there were, maybe we still have a distance to go, but I think today, instead of despairing, we should rather take a great deal of pride, a great deal of satisfaction. I myself, having been Having been, they have, have been a student of the, not the institute, but the Department of Chinese and Japanese Studies 50 years ago, just when the faculty was coming up. Professor Mohanty, as one of my tutors, Professor Obroy, may not remember, was guiding me for one tutorial. Uh, and Ambassador Rana, of course, is dealing with China much before us. I'm sure this book, and I want to just take this opportunity to congratulate the concept of this book and to complement the different contributors. And I hope when we read, we get the answers, not just to the success, but the, but the downside, the challenges, the issues, because it is, there is no denying China, whether it's a turning point or it has turned. We are, I think, that India, the single biggest challenge today is to understand what kind of a China are we dealing with, I think. And it has in foreign policy postures, in bilateral implications, certain facet. But here is a power, and here is a neighbor we have to deal with. And I, I hope there are answers. Uh, even to understand the secular developments in China, for us to make a more balanced and more realistic assessment of what we are dealing with. And let me just congratulate you again for your labor of love through your life. And wonderful to see the four generations of which we have also been somewhere in between, but not, of course, fundamental this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Siddhartha. Uh, if I might uh, just carry on from this. Is there any other post-colonial country, any other post-colonial country whose scholarship about China or for that matter anything is quoted more than the Indian one? No, no, that's not a post-colonial country, it's a post-colonial city. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, and if you do that... But, uh, but if you call it city, then the, then the example is even more powerful. No, it isn't. How does the city get to that? No, no, I, I think the point there, we're talking about, forget about China. 
I mean, the half. No, I'm not the, talking about China. I'm no, no, talking about Singapore. No, 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 no. What I'm trying to say is post colonial country, not about talking about Chinese studies. I'm talking about <laughs> any studies. I'm yes. sorry, the science citation index is very clear. The uh, social science citation index is also extremely clear. There is no other post-colonial country, and I'll accept this argument about about Singapore with respect to China because half of Singapore. No, not China. About everything. No, no, that's not that's not true at all. I'm sorry, I won't I won't accept that because it's factually wrong. At least as far as the science is concerned. Uh, and if anyone knows that, uh, please let me know. If any post-colonial country, which is quoted, for example, in physics, or for example, in nanotechnology or for example in bio uh, uh, neurology more than and though more than indian scientists working in india as distinct from anywhere else and if they do know it please let me know. thank you any other any other question, question regarding yeah. education you <coughs> Recent events between India and Pakistan, China appears to have taken a balanced, balanced view. So, what will be the view of the panelist? What they think uh, will this balance will continue or is it temporary? Okay, Sanjay, 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 Thank you very much. Uh, uh, in fact, I have uh, contributed one paper. Uh, it's about uh, factionism. I think uh, it is correlated uh, with corruption. Corruption is, uh, you know, in any society, it doesn't mean that corruption wasn't there before. It was uh, there, but uh, I, I have uh, correlated it with uh, the kind of factions, uh, you know, which I have tried to, to elucidate in my paper whether it is uh, uh, the reformers or uh, the new uh, Maoists, and especially uh, those who would like to challenge the path, the theory, and the system propounded by the present regime. And so I have uh, correlated with that. And uh, in order to understand the path and the theory and the system, I think we need another one hour or so. You know, so I will not uh, delve into that. Um, but uh, uh, I think I will also uh, make mention of, as far as uh, the citation is concerned, I think uh, uh, India has uh, delved into China study pretty late, you know, uh, and we are the late entrant as far as uh, China studies, uh, studies, studies is concerned. Of course, uh, I myself have written one paper, not in this book where I trace China studies in this country from the British uh, times, from uh, um, uh, 19, uh, 18, uh, uh, 19, uh, sorry, you know, uh, 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 George uh, uh, Marshman, you know, when he, he was ordered by Lord Minto to build China studies in India. Uh, it goes in from uh, 1890. So that was uh, the time when a British uh, 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 citizen, so he translated first uh, nine chapter of the Analects, uh, by uh, not by Confucius, by his uh, students, you know, the book was compiled. But then after that, Professor Monty has divided it into four so-called movements of China studies in India, I will not delve into that. But I think exactly when we lay emphasis, it was post-1962. So it's a very brief history of China studies in India. So uh, that should not be an excuse for not doing a good job. But I think uh, uh, the kind of capacity we should be building, or uh, you know, government and institution, they should be coming forth. So that has not happened in this country, unfortunately. And in China, you know, uh, for example, even the think tanks in the last in a couple of years, so they have gone to 450 plus. In, and in this country, 
I think, you know, very, very few, you know, not even 150 or so. Yet. But I will uh, maybe uh, stop here and thank you all. <coughs> thank you. I thank Professor Mohanty for inviting me to reply to the question on corruption. As the old adage goes, and those of us who have studied political science, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That is the case in China. And uh, while uh, writing this paper on corruption, I was in touch with uh, several old friends, and one of them is in Shanghai, which has always been an internal house of opposition to the Communist Party of China. Repeated, I mean, in the sense, he answered to my query by saying that your dear neighbor, in double quotes, Pakistan has it in them to convict a Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif for appearing on the Panama Papers. But Xi Jinping's sister, her name figures in the Panama Papers, but nothing has happened. Xi Jinping is in power, which is why I said power corrupts absolutely, and especially in a country where it's the Communist Party of China, Kujandang, which runs almost everything we know about China. Second aspect is uh, what the gentleman had asked, the first question to Professor Patrick Chevroy. And uh, why are we not being cited? Sir, I have a one word answer, theory. Where we are missing out when it comes to international relations and area studies is that we do not <coughs> encourage scholarship with a theoretical background. I have seen that even in the university where I am teaching where international relations are stuck in the Cold War and uh, people only talk about realism. Neorealism, they get uncomfortable. The moment you mention constructivism, which is the buzzword these days, people link it with cement companies and whatever. And then it's laughed at you. So which is why we are very good when to write articles which are narratives. But articles need to have theory. The conference room where we are, it is held together by bricks. That is the theoretical structure which is keeping us here. The narrative can follow after that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I uh, I've approached China uh, from a lawyer's perspective, more so as a practitioner rather than an academic. So I might sound a little different. <laughs> Uh, but uh, what amazed me was that China is constantly trying to tinker with its legal system, and reforming almost every sphere. Uh, it's almost like it's very fond of using law as a tool. So when I took up the subject of anti-corruption, what I examined was two things. Uh, what is China's you know, uh, visualization of rule of law? Uh, and of course the conclusion is that it's vastly different from what we understand from Western theory. And the second one was whether this anti-corruption reform or the new law, is it a purge, a political purge, or is it going to be more lasting? And I think the answer will be clear only many more years down the line, because uh, it has been launched as a purge, but uh, you, can, you can also not discount the fact that there are many other areas being reformed, so this is also one area. Uh, which you know needs some launch pad, but if it sustains itself over a period of time, results might be more visible. So that is some answer that I could not actually conclude because uh, it's only time that will say. Thank you. Uh, just to respond very quickly to Kanjwarma's question, you know, as the Masrana has already pointed out, you know, China has adopted a fairly you know cautious approach as far well as you know recent issues between India and Pakistan are concerned. Uh, China has interest in seeing that there's no escalation in tension between India and Pakistan, which will force them to you know, get more directly involved. At the same time, China has invested far too much in Pakistan to see Pakistan getting isolated. So it will remain a relatively <coughs> calibrated posture on part, part of China in days to come. Well, I think we'll have to bring the you know, Q&A session to a closure now. And I'll now request Dr. Madhavanandi to propose the vote. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the ICS, I'm here to give the vote. Thanks. Um, though the volume 
has emerged out of collective efforts here. The first vote of thank, of course, goes to Professor Manuel Ramonti, the editor of the volume, who conceptualized and shaped the volume, brought the contributors together in the initial workshop which was held in September 2017. <coughs> this edited volume went on to become a collective and committed effort of all senior fellows, colleagues and friends of the MCS and led to its su successful conclusion. The editorial committee comprised of the ICS senior fellows, Professor Tatrisha Oberoi, Ambassador Kishan Rana, Mr. Ravi Bhutalingam, Professor Alka Acharya, Ambassador Ashok Kantha, who gave their full support. They were referees, reviewers, and editors of many of the papers, and their contribution was most <coughs> valuable. Uh, the advice of Professor Shabri Mitra, is a, as an expert in Chinese language and literature, was of utmost help, and Ambassador Kantha, Director ICS, provided full encouragement and support in seeing this volume through. Dr. Bhim Subba, who has been mentioned by all the panelists here, needs a special sincere thanks and a cheer. Thank you for your <laughs> he pursued all the contributors with the deadlines, checked facts, cited in papers, pointed out gaps and references, and in most cases completed them. Also prepared the appendices and led the entire effort to its conclusion. He was completely invested in it for over a year and kept prodding us gently with all the deadlines. He held the volume together, coordinating between the contributors, editorial committee, copy editor, and the publisher. So he deserves our sincere appreciation. Along the way, he was assisted by bright research assistants and interns at the IC, <coughs> Saurabh Sarkar, Pratma Basu, Shrishti Singh, Surpi Lohia, and Navreet Kuldar. A big thank you to them. Dr. Jagan Jacob, who had been part of the group initially, which was first discuss and discussed the idea of launching the project along with Professor Mohanty nearly two years ago. He garnered the intellectual resources and brought the three generations of contributors together. And we have warmly acknowledged his contribution to this effort. We thank the participants in the workshop and the symposium that were held in early September 2017 and early December 2017, respectively. And special thanks to all the discussants of the papers. Ambassador Shamsaran's participation was also quite important in, in this discussion. Comments were also received from Dr. Vidyut Mohanty, Dr. Hemat Allakha, and Mr. Rafi Rafai, who pro provided invaluable uh, comments and giving and gave the final a lot in terms of the final shape of the, uh, the book. Uh, two major partners, the India International Centre and Council for Social Development, have been valuable partners of the ICS in most of its programs. The CSD hosted the first workshop that was held in September and uh, in December 2017 and the book release was co-hosted by the IIC. So we thank both the institutions. The ICS faculty, Dr. Sharin Chongchong, Dr. Nirmala Sharma, Dr. P.K. Anand, besides Dr. Bhim Subba, contributors themselves, were always available to lend their shoulder to the beam. The administrative staff of the ICS, Mr. Kripal Singh Rawat, Mr. P. R. Singh, Mr. Ram Singh, Mr. Ramji Lal provided much needed support behind, behind, the, scene, behind the scenes. We are also fortunate to get a competent, competent editorial consultant, Ms. Seema Guha, who is a copy editor and a very well-known journalist. She worked through the draft for almost 9 to 10 months now, um, and she deserves our sincere thanks. Mr. Rajan Arya of Pentagon Press, was most supportive with the shifting deadlines and finalizing the manuscript. He and his team assisted in presenting us with multiple options of the cover and technical solutions to a lot of things. We thank him for respecting his partnership with ICS in the publication program. Most importantly, the ICS thanks all the 25 contributors of the volume whose cooperation was utmost in making this volume possible. Professor Patricia O'Brien for the foreword. And we are truly indebted to her for her experience and guiding us, and there's a lot to learn from her still. <laughs> Lastly, thank you very much for attending the book release, and thank you, panelists. Your presence means so much to us. Thank you.